Can we finance a green recovery from COVID-19? And if we do, what policies are going to make that possible? Estelle Cantillon of the Université Libre de Bruxelles believes that there are two policy levers that are going to be essential for any Green New Deal. Hello, Estelle. Hello, Tim. Now, Estelle, uh, a recovery, a green recovery from the COVID-19 economic crisis implies that green recovery, economic recovery are complementary. Other people argue that we have to do the economic part first and then we get to the green part. So who's right? So I think the, the, the first, the, those who argue that we can do both at the same time uh, are right. And for there are two reasons for this. One is that, and I'm going to use economic jargon here, dynamic optimization is better than sequential optimization. So I think it's, it's we, given that we know that we have a long-term challenge, might as well try to do it at, and, and deal with a short-term challenge with an eye on the the long term challenge and also because some of the sectors that are heavily affected by covid are sectors and i think about you know uh transportation energy tourism they are sectors that were due for structural change anyways and so we might as well use that opportunity to push them on the right path yes you imply that, that it's good to do a strategic recovery in sectors what does this mean? Well, it's, for example, being strategic, for example, means that you need to recognize that some assets will be stranded anyways. Maybe it was supposed they were supposed to be uh, stranded in in twenty day in twenty years, and uh, they're being affected right now. So we might as well say, like, well, you know, why save them given that they were going to go out anyway. So that's a first, uh, first thing to, to do. Second thing, we might use um, the recovery measures to accelerate change. Third, we may actually want to focus on uh, efforts and money and subsidies and, and whatever on sectors that were going to go uh, up anyways, that were, we, were, we knew were growth areas for the green uh, transition. So and fourth, uh, being strategic also means cutting hidden subsidies, for example. A green recovery like this sounds expensive. Can we afford it? So I think it's, it's, all of, it's, it's about budgets and spending money. And it's true that politicians talk a lot about spending money, but it's also about the revenue side and making sure incentives are pushing the economy in the right direction. So I think we definitely can afford it uh, because we can balance uh, uh those those two things. So make sure also the green recovery should also um, involve putting a price on carbon and a consistent price on carbon, for example. You're also arguing that um, any government aid should be conditional. Uh, what are the conditions? Why is this useful? So it's again, so here, some of these sectors, we've talked about transportation, we've talked about energy. So some of these sectors have been pushing hard against um, change. They've tried to hang on on their, you know, some of them were subsidized. I mean, think about aviation uh, or some of them were trying to uh, delay um, a strength, uh, stricter emission standards, for example. And so now that we're spending public taxpayer money on, on them, I think we can say, look, you know, you were pushing hard against this measure. Well, if we give you money, then we might as well also force you to do those changes. And these are investments, by the way. So they're also helping, uh, um, they're helping the recovery, they're helping the economy, but just putting the economy on the right path. So to sum up what you're saying here, the, the two policy levers that really matter are um, conditional aid mm -hmm. and Prices matter, getting the prices right on this. Yeah, and prices, by the way, so I think all economies, so there's, unan <laughs> there's unanimity among economies that prices matter. We need to have the right prices. We haven't been heard so much by uh, politicians who have been reluctant to uh, to put a price of preferred subsidies. I think in, a, you know, in the current budgetary situations, uh, maybe we don't, uh, we may not um, be able to afford any more subsidies. And I think prices is uh, putting a price on an externality really matters. And um, 
and there's plenty of evidence that it works. I mean, even if you think about the European Union, um, there are three big sectors. One is a sector that's subject to the emission trading scheme. That's been a price on this since 2005. Sometimes it's been too low, okay? But at least it's been a price on emissions by uh, from these sectors. Another uh, part has been aviation that's basically been subsidized. Okay, and if you look also, and then a third part of the economy are sectors that are not aviation and not subject to the emission trading schemes, but non what are what are these are called non ETS sectors. They've been subject to a patchwork of regulations, sometimes standards, sometimes a little bit of a taxes, but or subsidies. And if you look at the evolution of the emissions of these three parts of the economy, for aviation it's gone up, and it's been subsidized. Okay. Uh, and the the sectors under uh, subject to the emission trading scheme has gone down, and these are the, you know, that's where you see that prices matter. And if another example would be the UK, in the UK you've on top of the emission trading schemes, the UK has imposed what is called a carbon price supplement on on emissions from the energy sectors, and electricity produced out of coal has basically been disappearing. So it's been incredibly effective to push out coal from electricity production. And but of course the here, I mean, I think the, the, there are two issues here. One is that we need to make sure that the prices on carbon is consistent across the different sectors. That's one. And the second is that it's sufficiently stable as a price signal because the reason why we want a price is to provide incentives for investment. But let's have a look at that EU emissions trading scheme. Okay. Because yeah. they're negotiating it again coming up in 2021, aren't they? Um, it's been criticised in the past for setting the price of carbon too low. Are they going to get the changes right this time? Are they going to get the price of carbon right this time? This has been a work in progress, right? It's been improving and going in the right direction since 2005. It's indeed due for review in 2001, uh, 2021. And I think there are two issues here is in terms of sectors, do we, do we want to extend it to other sectors? First question. And what do we do with the price volatility? And that's actually something I'm doing research on. Um, I've mentioned the fact that you need stable price is to provide incentives um, uh, for investment because when the price is really all you know all over the place is you know a firm that needs to invest millions to uh, change its technology is going to be reluctant uh, to do this um, and um, uh, so the kind so and that's you know that's where my I think my research can inform some of some of these things because the reason what what drives the, the high volatility of these prices uh, on the carbon market is just risk management by uh, the firm subject to these emission trading scheme and so it seems that it's fairly intrinsic it's going to be volatile anyways uh, and respond to short term uh, shocks even though in principle an allowance is something you could actually you know, you could, even if you produce emissions today, you could buy your emissions, uh, your allowances for to cover this in two months. It doesn't matter. But typically firms would try to cover their emissions, uh, buy allowances to cover their current emissions. Um, and so given this, I think you need to think about when you think about which sectors to include in the ETS, you need to think about where, which are the sectors where investment is bulky. Like we're talking a big, big investment, it's it's hard to do incremental changes to reduce emissions versus, and those that are bulky, I think you might as well leave them out of the ETS and just put a price on carbon. A carbon tax would be much more effective. Generic change. Also coming up in Europe are negotiations on the energy taxation directive, aren't they? I think the Commission has acknowledged that it does not align with a, a green agenda. So what's going to happen with the negotiations on this? What do they need to do? So here, I mean, again, so the challenge indeed is the fact that um, so right now this uh, energy taxation directive puts minimum uh, min, uh, minimum levels for taxes on on energy sources, and what you see the uh, the OECD has, has done remarkable work on this is they've compared the carbon the implicit carbon price on the different sources of energy, and you see that first. Um, you know, heating, all of the so it there's are very different prices across sectors, basically very different prices, uh, and in particular, again, aviation, maritime transportation, all of these are just they have just a zero price on carbon. This is you know, uh, any economist would also tell you that you might as well try to <laughs> to have the same price across different uh, sources of emissions. So that's something that's the challenge, and the reason why it's not happening, they're putting a minimum. The 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 directive puts a minimum. 
level on, on taxes. But so, it, of course, countries could decide to put a higher price if they wanted. But there the issue is carbon leakage. So I'm coming from a small country. Imagine that, uh, you know, Belgium would put some more taxations on aviations. I can tell you that most people will go and fly from uh, Paris, Cologne, you know, we've got f plenty of airports uh, within 200 kilometers from here. So that's that's the issue is this carbon leakage and, and competition to the bottom and and changing this would will will is just a coordination problem basically now the eu isn't the only place where there are green policy proposals yeah. we're seeing green new deals being talked about all over the place not so many adopted yet though what do you see that's impressed you so i guess we know what the solution so i think it's if if, if it's impressive it's about the political ability to to implement changes because that's really it's not about designing solutions i think we know what what would work uh, but it's about pushing this forward and so far i mean if anything you know right now the united states i mean they've actually gone exactly the opposite of the strategic recovery measures that i've discussed before i mean they've really just poured a lot of money on the sectors that for sure are going to be stranded if we want to go for a transition. Um, but the, um, you know, some governments have put conditional, conditional aid, even in Europe, has been very timid. Um, initially, the commission in, in the, the DG competition in, the, in its initial note about state aid said, we this should be consistent with the two big pillars of the Euro, of the European agenda, which are digitalization and green deal. Very little has been done in practice, unfortunately. So the answer to my question is really not a lot has impressed me <laughs> so far about this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Estelle, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Keep in touch with Estelle's work in progress over the next few months. Meanwhile, thanks for watching. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.